Hi, here on Workbench today, I have something a little bit different. It is an active probe sent in from Euler Precision in Switzerland. They just released this affordable ESAP-30 3GHz bandwidth single-ended active probe, and of course, we'll take a deeper look in this video. I'll also provide the link in the video description below if you are interested in getting one. The probe I received here is one of their engineering samples, as you can see here. It says engineering sample. And they also had provided me with some information on what will likely be changed in the final version of the product. So when you are watching the video, just keep in mind that the actual product might have minor tweaks here and there. Now, there are typically two different kinds of active probes for oscilloscopes, single-ended and differential. The ESAP-30 is a single-ended probe and is suitable for measuring signals with respect to ground. Before I get much further, let's actually briefly talk about why you might need an active probe. Everybody watching this channel probably has used a passive oscilloscope probe before. One thing you will notice is that the bandwidth of a passive probe probably tops at around 500 MHz. And the main reason for that is the high input capacitance. Typically, the input capacitance of a passive probe is around 10 to 15 picofarads. Different designs can have slightly different input capacitance, but generally speaking, you can't get much lower beyond 10 picofarads. And because of this input capacitance, as the measurement frequency increases, the impedance drops significantly. For example, for a 10 picofarads capacitor, the impedance is around 1.6 megaohms at 10 kHz but it is only around 160 ohms at 100 MHz. So the loading effect of the probe is going to become significant once you go above around 70 MHz. This will become a major problem measuring clock signals, as square waves have very high frequency harmonics content. With the probe loading, you're not going to get sharp edges, and this loading effect will potentially impact your measurement accuracy as well. And for some sensitive circuitry, it may no longer even work properly due to the loading effect. For an active probe, the input capacitance can be made much lower. The ESAP-30, for example, the specified input capacitance is less than 3 picofarads. Actually, it's between 1 picofarads and 3 picofarads, depends on the type of input connectors you use. Anyway, the input capacitance for higher-end active probes can be actually much smaller than 1 picofarad. So the input capacitance and the associated loading effect is one of the main reasons why you may want to use an active probe instead especially for measurement frequencies beyond 100 MHz. Also, active probes tend to have better noise figure, which is good for analyzing small signals. Of course, there are some drawbacks for active probes as well. One of the main drawbacks is that they are very expensive. A brand new single-ended active probe can cost a fortune. In this table provided by Euler Precision, you can see that a typical single-ended active probe costs at least a couple of thousand dollars. And that's where the ESAP-30 fills the gap. It's under $1,000, and it offers very competitive specifications. Anyway, with the basics out of the way, let's actually take a look at what's provided with the ESAP-30 Active Probe. The ESAP-30 comes in this instrument case, as I showed you earlier. And besides the probe itself, it also comes with this tripod. Yes, it needs a tripod because this is a precision instrument, and you really need a tripod to hold the instrument in place while doing measurement on your circuit board. So let me take a look at the tripod. Now, my understanding is this is a pre-release model, and the actual one supplied will be slightly different. But anyway, you can see here, you can snap them together, and this is the tripod. And you have a couple of different slots on the side, you can see here. You can mount them different ways. For example, let's say we can mount it horizontally like this, or we can mount it in slight angle if we use this slot instead. So you can see here, now, you can put this on the bench, and it will be angled downwards. We'll see that in action a little bit later. You are also provided with a USB charging adapter and USB cable. The charging adapter here is white. Now, I was told that the production unit will come with a black power adapter to match the rest of the components. Anyway, here you also got a couple of these coaxial cables. Now, they are of different connectors. Let's actually take them out for a quick look. So one of these you can see here is a MMCX to MMCX connector, and the other one is a, by the look of it, MMCX to UFL connector. And finally, we also have a box of these flex PCB connectors. And the idea is you can solder these flex PCBs onto your test board and connect the other end with your probe via these MMCX connectors, as you can see here. 
Now, I have already soldered a couple onto a test board, which I will show you a little bit later. The process may seem a little bit convoluted, but this is actually quite common for these active probes, as most of the time the signals you are trying to probe is on crowded PCBs and making casual probing almost impossible. So you do need these kind of specialized adapters to solder onto the PCB. And by default, the main connector on the probe is an MMCX, and I mentioned earlier you can actually desolder that connector from the board and use shorter headers instead. These headers are provided and you can solder these onto the probe. And if you forego the MMCX connector, you can actually solder these connectors on, and that will further reduce the input capacitance down to about one picofarad. Also, we've got this measurement report. Each unit is individually measured by Euler Precision. You can see here the forward gain is reasonably flat, at least up to around 1 GHz. You can see the marker here, M2, that's 1 GHz, and the gain flatness is within 0.5 decibels. The attenuation does get a little bit worse after 1 GHz, and you're looking at an additional 0.5 decibel loss after that. And what else? You can see, and here we have the S11 measurement with respect to frequency, and here you can see this is the measured input capacitance. So you can see from this table, the input capacitance is mainly within 2 picofarads, which supports the claimed 3 picofarads maximum capacitance. All right, with the specs out of the way, let's actually take a look at some real-world measurements. For the demonstration, let's actually take a look at the signal output from an oscillator. Here on the circuit board, I have two identical oscillators, and you can see here, these two have a resonant frequency of 57 MHz, the reason I choose these is because that's the highest frequency oscillator I have. Now, you may think the signal frequency is relatively low. After all, the bandwidth of the active probe is 3 GHz. Well, because of the output from the oscillator is a square wave, the harmonics extends well into hundreds of MHz, so a faster probe will give you higher fidelity and should produce sharper rising and falling edges. So this would definitely be a good test. The reason I have these two oscillators here is because I wanted to try out the different flex PCB adapters Euler Precision provided. Now, these probe adapters are relatively lengthy, which is not really ideal for probing high frequency signals because of the inductance, so we probably would see some ringing as a result. So the probe adapters here have one minor difference. You can see, not sure how well you can see here, let me just zoom in a little bit more. So the first one here, you can see we have this damping resistor close to the signal pin, which should dampen the ringing. And the other one, we don't have this damping resistor built in, so I expected to see a little bit more ringing. Let's first take a look at the signal output from the one without the damping resistor. All right, I just connected up. And by the way, right now we're not getting a stable trigger. That's because the trigger is actually triggering on channel 2. We'll auto-acquire momentarily. And by the way, here is where the stand comes in handy. Now, for this particular test, I probably don't need the stand. But for most situations, especially if you're probing over a large PCB, you definitely need the stand so that your probe can be angled properly. And now you can see here, the probe is placed such that it's close to the circuit board. The probe actually has two positions. You can see the two sets of grooves on the side. And using this one, you can angle it. And the other one, you can put it horizontally. All right, let me acquire the signal. Yeah, you can see the ringing is quite significant. And by the way, the active probe has a fixed times 10 attenuation built in. I think I forgot to mention earlier. So let's actually take a look at the other probe adapter with a damping resistor built in. And of course, I need to change the power here. As you can see here, the signal is a lot cleaner. The ringing is not gone completely, but it's greatly reduced. So I guess for any high frequency measurements, you probably wanted to use shorter probe tips so that the inductance can be reduced. As the user manual suggested, you could desolder the MMCX connector on the active probe and replace it with some headers, which are also provided. And by the way, you can probably see here, we picked up the frequency, which is 57 MHz here. And now let's actually compare the results with the standard passive probe. The first probe I'm going to use is this 500 MHz probe. I had to remove the ground clip and added a spring adapter so we can minimize the inductance introduced by the ground clip. 
And let me enable channel 2. And by the way, the input impedance for channel 2 is configured as 1 MHz. Let me show you. And this is actually important for a times 10 probe. If you accidentally selected 50 ohm, the signal will be heavily distorted. Let me actually show you that. So let's actually change it to 50 ohm. So now we're 50 ohm terminated. And let me actually show you the signal here. Let's move it down a little bit. And you can see how heavily distorted the signal is. And that's because of the impedance mismatch. The times 10 probe is actually expecting a 1 mega ohm input impedance. So let's actually change the input impedance here. So let's change it back to 1 meg. And you can see that the signal becomes slightly better. So now you have these two signals side by side. Up here, the yellow trace, that's from the active probe. Down here, the sign trace, that's from the 500 microns passive probe. And you can see that the trace captured by the passive probe, the rising edge and the falling edge, they are not as sharp as what is captured by the active probe. The corners are a little bit rounded here. And that's because of the probe loading effect. In fact, you can see that with the passive probe attached, it actually impacted the original signal quality. So if I remove it, you can see that we actually have a little bit more ring here. That's because we have less load on the signal here. Anyway, so you can see this probing itself actually impacted the signal quality. So for even faster signals, this difference will become even more pronounced. Now I'm looking at the same signal with a 100 MHz passive probe. And you can see that there is some phase shift and also the edges are even more gradual. Euler Precision does mention in the user manual that the MMCX connector that is soldered onto the PCB can be desoldered and replaced with a shorter header that is also included. Their ESAP-30H version will come without the MMCX connector, which will definitely reduce the input capacitance. For the next demonstration, let's actually take a look at the reference clock signal in the RF synthesizer section of the SV6301A VNA. More specifically, I want to take a look at the RF reference signal feeding into the MAX 2870E, which is our 23.5 MHz to 6 GHz RF synthesizer. And the reference frequency feeds into the MAX 2870E via pin 29 via a capacitor. I just zoomed in a little bit. Hopefully you can see better. Not sure how well you can see. But anyway, I had already soldered two wires from the ground and also pin 29 onto this flex PCB. And now I just set up the active probe you can see here, and I'm using a stand, I put in an angle so that we can actually probe this signal. So let me actually first power it on. And now it is powered on, and we do get something on the scope, but let me actually acquire the signal here. Now just take a look at the capture signal here. You can see that the signal quality is tremendously better. And of course, the probe stand also comes in handy, as you can see here. And in this specific measurement, I could just put a probe flat on the table here. But in situations, if you're probing over a large PCB, you want to make sure that you have proper clearance between the probe and the circuitry. And you will definitely need a stand to ensure that it can be angled properly for your measurement. Now, you do notice that the signal has some ringing here, and that is due to the long flex PCB, unfortunately. A few flex PCBs included have a damping resistor towards the tip, so that should help reduce the ringing. But the adapter used for this one does not have the damping resistor, so the ringing is a little bit more pronounced. For the next demonstration, I'm going to measure a 100 MHz signal coming out from the signal generator on this VNA. I could set the frequency much higher on the VNA because it supports frequencies into the gigahertz range. But since we have a 500 MHz scope, the captured edges will deteriorate quickly after a couple of hundred megahertz. So let's actually start with 100 megahertz. Of course, we'll take a look at higher frequencies a little bit after this. And also the adapter I used for this measurement, you can see it has a resistor at the tip. Not sure if you can see that, it's right here. And that should help dampen the ringing effect. Even with this damping resistor, I suspect that we're still gonna see some ringing just because we're at much higher frequency. And also the inductance here is gonna be significant with the frequency we're trying to measure. So here is the 100 MHz signal captured with the active probe, and you can see that indeed we have some ring here, and that's because of the traces on the adapter is on the long side. Now I just change the VNA to output 200 MHz, and you can see that the captured waveform, of course, 
has significant ringing and no longer looks like a squirt wave. Again, this is partially because of the capacitance at the input, also partially because we have a 500 megahertz scope. And this bandwidth is no longer adequate to reconstruct a 200 megahertz square wave. But nevertheless, you can see that we captured this with relatively sharp rising and falling edges. Anyway, from the demonstrations I just showed you here, you saw how important it is to use an active probe to measure this kind of fast signals. So that's pretty much all I wanted to demo. Now let's open it up and take a look inside. And I just removed the cover. You can see here's the cover. And it's very nicely put together. Of course, Euler Precision did mention that they're going to tweak their manufacturing process a little bit. So the final product perhaps will be slightly different. But you can see here it's a very nice case. The unit is powered by this single 18650 cell. And you can see here it is a very high quality cell. According to Euler Precision, the runtime of this when powered on is around 16 hours. So that's plenty. Let me remove this cell here. And of course, we have two more screws. Let's remove these so we can take out the PCB. Now, keep in mind that this is a pre-production engineering sample. So you do see a couple of barge wires here. In the information provided to me, Euler Precision did mention that these barge wires are here to reduce the ripple on output voltage due to the WS2812B RGB LED power issue. They also intended to replace this WS2812B with a regular RGB LED in production. Anyway, as you can see here, the front end uses this BUF802 as a high input impedance buffer. The operating frequency of the BUF802 is up to 3.1 GHz, which covers the operating frequency of the active probe. Now, if you look around the board, you can see that there seems to be some conformal coating on the board, which makes the part numbers very difficult to read. But in essence, you would have a wideband amplifier built in. Also, due to the high frequency, you can see the dense via stitching that is needed to reduce the impedance between the different layers. Now, obviously, there is a microcontroller on board, as you can see from the zero wire debugging pads here. If I have a guess, the circuitry under the shielding can would be the amplifier section. Let's actually remove the shielding can. And here is what's under the shielding can. Now, of course, we can't read the part numbers here, but it does look like we have this amplifier chip here. And these are just some of the associated LC decoupling circuitry. Now, the good news is Euler Precision plans to release the detailed schematics in the future. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Anyway, hats off to Euler Precision's engineers. The price point for this active probe is actually quite reasonable, given the significant efforts involved in designing, testing, and manufacturing. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.